we know that our choices will determine our future, that the very worst can still be avoided. But we also know that the window of time is closing fast. 2021, just in America alone, torrential floods, record-breaking droughts, off-the-chart heat waves kill hundreds in the Pacific Northwest. In the same year, a deep freeze led to the death of hundreds in Texas. The second largest wildfire in the history of California burns the West Coast at the same time the second largest hurricane in American history batters the Gulf Coast. Finally, disastrous tornadoes rip through the Midwest in December. Unfortunately, for climate scientists like Dr. Andrew Dessler of Texas A&M, much of what unfolded in 2021 wasn't exactly surprising. Climate change now affects every weather event. Uh, we live in a world that's considerably warmer than it was 100, 150 years ago, and that changes everything about the, um, the, the climate system and weather as we experience it. It's making heat waves worse. It's making precipitation, intense precipitation events more intense. It's causing sea levels to rise. It's acidifying the ocean. It's all of the things that scientists have been saying, if you add a lot of carbon to the atmosphere, this is gonna happen. Um, those are things that are happening now because we added a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. In August, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a major report on the current state of the climate crisis. The report confirmed that each of the last four decades have been successively warmer than any other decade that preceded it since 1850. And the next three decades are guaranteed to be even warmer than this one. It really highlights that even at 1.1 degrees now, we are seeing very clearly changes in extreme weather. Dr. Ed Hawkins was a lead author of that report. So it says very clearly, again, that we're seeing heat, wa heat waves get more frequent and more intense across most of the planet. We're seeing more extreme heavy rainfall events, again, over many regions. And in other regions, we're seeing increasing droughts. Um, and so we can also attribute those changes in many cases to human actions and human influence. And so we're very clearly saying that human actions are already affecting these very severe weather events, which have enormous impacts on people and society and ecosystems. And as the planet continues to warm, those impacts will just get worse. You know, those events will become more frequent and more intense um, as the climate warms. Here's climate scientist, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. They said, for example, that we know that it's warming faster than any time in the last 2000 years of human history. And honestly, when you look further back, it's pretty much any time in human history. They also said very clearly that our future is in our hands. In the words of the IPCC report, um, the 1.5 degree report that they published in 2018, they said, every year matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every choice matters. Every action matters. And to me, that is the bottom line of the science. The impacts we saw in 2021 were the consequence of decades of denial and deadly political delay. In this episode, we'll look at the damage that unfolded in America alone, from extreme weather disasters to misinformation continuing to spread, and then take a step back to think about the global stakes. What has 2021 taught us about our continued fight against climate change? What will we lose as our natural world continues to suffer? This is the Climate Pods 2021 Year in Review, Part 1, Denial and Consequences. America was unprepared for the climate-fueled weather events of 2021, not because its leaders lacked foresight, but rather they didn't act. So before we look at what happened this year, first, we need to understand how it was allowed to happen. Dr. Naomi Oreskes, scientific historian and co-author of Merchants of Doubt, explains just how fossil fuel companies and their political allies spent decades promoting disinformation, sowing doubt, and delaying action on climate. Well, the purpose for ExxonMobil, particularly if we go back to the 1970s and 80s, was for them to understand what this problem was, because the corporate executives clearly understood that climate change was potentially a very significant issue for their business model. And we know this in part because they themselves discussed things like the carbon budget, and the carbon budget, the whole notion of a carbon budget is saying, well, there's only so much oil, gas, and coal that we can afford to burn. And therefore, once we get past that, 
uh, companies like ExxonMobil may have to do something else. So this shows that they are very, very well aware of this problem going back to the late 1970s. Um, and they are aware of what this might mean for their business model. So what did ExxonMobil and others do about the problem that their own scientists found? They had a kind of fork in the road uh, in the 1980s, particularly around 1988, when uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is first uh, formulated, when uh, Jim Hansen testifies in, in Congress that climate change is underway, and then in 1992, when the U.S., signs the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So this is a kind of crucial scientific and political moment where scientists are saying this is real, it's starting to happen, and we need to do something about it. And political leaders are listening. And so ExxonMobil faces a fork in the road. They can either listen to their own scientists, listen to global scientists, and say, OK, well, we have to figure out a different business model, or they can deny the science. And sadly, they took the second route. How do you keep doubling down on fossil fuel infrastructure for decades after the warning alarms go off? Convince enough of the public and, more importantly, politicians, that the science of global warming was uncertain. Was that if people believe that the science is uncertain, then they will be less likely to act and they will be less likely to support other people's actions. So less likely to vote for a candidate who wants to make climate change a high priority, less likely to support putting a price on carbon, uh, less likely to support regulations to improve gas fuel efficiency. But it wasn't just scientists that spouted disinformation. Here's historian Ben Franta. One of my recent papers is about economists and how fossil fuel industry funded a relatively small group of economists to write study after study saying climate action is too expensive and then that message would get broadcast to the public um, without mentioning that it had been funded by the industry or that these economists had worked for the industry for for many years oil companies coal companies car companies etc cetera, etc cetera, have made a conscientious effort almost since the very moment that we understood the problem to prevent action from accelerating to deny the science right to downplay the consequences to promote division between various groups um, to emphasize the cost of change but never the cost of inaction alex stefan longtime climate writer and author of the snap forward right they have benefited at the harm of many people including future generations by benefit by by delaying action but that can't go on forever Dr. Michael Mann, climate scientist and author of The New Climate War. These uh, forces of inaction, uh, I, I call them the inactivists, recognize that they can't deny that climate change is happening now. It's just become too obvious to the person on the street. We're seeing the impacts of climate change play out in real time on our television screens, in our newspaper headlines, in our social media feeds. Um, and so they can't credibly argue that it's not happening or even that it's not caused by human activity. So what they've done instead is to pivot to uh, this other sort of um, uh, equally nefarious but uh, more insidious uh, set of tactics um, in their effort to thwart climate action. So what are inactivists doing to delay action? Doom-mongering. Uh, dividing, division, uh, divisiveness, um, often related to uh, getting us fighting about our individual lifestyle choices, which of course is a manifestation of this deflection campaign to get us to focus on individual actions rather than the needed policies. Though action was delayed, the impacts of the climate crisis were not. In 2021, the first major extreme weather event hit the United States in February, when Texas experienced temperatures more than 50 degrees below normal for that time of year. How does a warming planet cause a deep freeze in typically warm climates? Dr. Catherine Hayhoe explains. We now know that the stretching of the polar vortex, which is occurring because of a warming Arctic, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. We know that the stretching of the polar vortex initiates events like the big Texas freeze. 
AccuWeather estimated that the economic cost of the winter storm was as much as $130 billion, making it one of the most expensive disasters in Texas history. On top of that, Texas consumers paid an additional $50 billion in electricity bills as prices spiked in the short term and caused supply shortages for months. All while natural gas companies in Texas reported record profits due to outrageous prices for their product, which failed to do the one thing it was supposed to do, keep the lights on. In just months after the Texas freeze, an even more unlikely weather event occurred in America. Here's David Wallace-Wells, author of The Uninhabitable Earth. The thing that's been most striking to me about the aftermath of the, the heat wave, the heat dome in, in the Pacific Northwest, is how many scientists were out in public immediately saying, this really freaks us out. Dr. Andrew Dessler was one of those climate scientists. The models did not predict it would get that hot. And again, that's something that the models should have predicted um, reason, at least in a statistical sense. They should have said it's possible to have a heat wave this warm. And none of the models said that. This is not an event that we expected to see for decades. And the fact that we're seeing it now means we have to really at least revisit and possibly recalibrate some of our most fundamental assumptions about what the near future is going to look like. And by that, they didn't mean the near future is going to be happier and smoother. <laughs> they meant the opposite. And that's, you know, given how disruptive we thought it was going to be, it's a, it's a pretty bad sign indeed. Over four days in late June, temperatures exceeded 100 degrees in Oregon, Washington, and parts of Western Canada. Daily temperature records were being set and broken day after day throughout the region. Seattle, which had recorded just three 100-degree days in the last 126 years, exceeded 100 degrees three straight days in June of 2021. People in their minds have this idea that every degree of warming gives them a little bit of damage. And then at the end, the sum of, a, of, of all these little damages is a lot of damage. And the short answer is that's not the way the world works. In reality, as the world warms, uh, you get no damage until you pass a threshold. And once you pass these thresholds, the damage increases exponentially. That threshold was exceeded in Western Canada when Lytton, British Columbia, broke Canada's all-time temperature record by reaching 121 degrees Fahrenheit on June 30th. The next day, the town of Lytton was gone, wiped off the map by a raging wildfire, flamed by the tinderbox of a town experiencing its country's worst heat wave. Nearly 1,000 people died across the Pacific Northwest as a result of the four-day heat wave. The heat wave was the deadliest weather event to ever hit the region. Extreme heat and heat is killing more Americans than any other climate-driven hazard. Kathy Boffman McLeod studies extreme heat. You've had, um, you know, more carnage and and more um, long-term impacts, both health and economic. Just as Texas's infrastructure froze, the Pacific Northwest's infrastructure melted under the unprecedented heat. Roads buckled, power cables melted. It's becoming more and more clear that today's infrastructure was not built for today's temperatures, let alone the warming that's already baked into the next three decades. The science says we are already, as a planet, entirely outside the window of temperatures that enclose all of human history, which means that everything we have ever done as a civilization is the result of climate conditions we've already left behind. Things are going to get, as different as they are now, they're going to get dramatically more different over the course of the century. And almost every aspect of human life, I believe, will be uh, transformed, which is to say, in most cases, disrupted. Just two weeks after the Pacific Northwest heat wave, in California, the Dixie wildfire started burning in Feather River Canyon. That fire would burn for over four months before being fully contained, engulfing nearly one million acres and over 1,300 buildings in its flames. Though slightly smaller than 2020's August Complex fire, which is the largest in California history, the Dixie wildfire burned nearly 400 more structures than the August Complex, and its smoke filled the air as far away as New York City. So the air is drier, the ground is drier, and that's providing more fuel for these fires, and they're burning at intensities we haven't really observed before. Jeff Baradelli, meteorologist for CBS News. They're spreading faster, they're burning more acres that we haven't observed before. For every increase of a degree in temperature, we see an exponential increase in the acres burned. It's not linear. 
And while California's second largest fire burned, Oregon's third largest wildfire in the history of the state burned more than 400,000 acres. The bootleg fire started on July 6th and lasted 39 days before nearly 2,000 firefighters were able to contain it. The fires were so big that they created their own weather. So what's happening is you get so much intense heat in these fires that you get rapidly, rapidly rising air. It causes these pyrocumulus or pyrocumulonimbus clouds. Now, a pyrocumulonimbus cloud is a thunder, a cumulonimbus cloud is a thunderstorm cloud, and it produces its own lightning. So now you have a thunderstorm, which can sometimes spin. They can sometimes produce tornadoes, so fire nadoes is fairly new to the vernacular, but it's happening a lot. According to the National Interagency Fire Center, more than 6.6 million acres have burned due to wildfires in the United States in 2021. That's almost the size of the state of Massachusetts. Rapid global warming made these fires the monsters that they were, just like it caused the American Southwest to experience the longest drought the region has witnessed in over 2,000 years. Dr. Park Williams of UCLA explains. But in terms of intensity, uh, it turns out that the last 20 years appear to be just as dry as the worst mega droughts. For the first time ever, officials declared a water shortage at Lake Mead, one of the largest reservoirs in the Colorado River, which supplies water to 40 million Americans in the Southwest. And so in 2021, we saw record lows because of a combination of near record breaking drought conditions in 2021 combined with the fact that 2021 occurred right when everybody was hoping this 20 year drought would be ending. And instead, 2021 shows us that we're just as much in the thick of things as we have been at any other time during this 2020 or the, during this 22 year uh, drought period. Life's most critical resource is evaporating before our eyes. If water disappears from a, from a location, then people can't live there anymore. And it's as simple as that. As the Southwest experienced extreme drought, Hurricane Ida, the second largest hurricane in Louisiana history, smashed the Gulf Coast as a Category 4 hurricane after having developed in the Gulf of Mexico with incredible speed and intensity. So over the past uh, four decades, um, rapid intensification has increased five miles an hour. Uh, actually, it's 4.4 miles an hour uh, per decade. And so when you add it up over the course of four decades, instead of a storm rapidly intensifying at 40 miles an hour, in 24 hours, like it would have been in the 1980s. Now it rapidly intensifies by 60 miles an hour in 24 hours. And that's a, that's a big difference. So now it's 20 miles an hour stronger than it would have otherwise been. So of course, Ida would have still been a major hurricane, still caused a lot of damage. But 20 miles an hour makes a big difference. Let me tell you why. And you probably know this already if you saw my segment from a few days ago. But um, if you compare a hurricane with winds of 75 miles an hour with a hurricane of winds of 150 miles an hour, you don't double or triple or quadruple the damage. The damage, is, damage potential is 250 times higher. Ida knocked out power and caused considerable death and destruction throughout Louisiana, but its biggest death toll came after it left the state and traveled northeast. Moving slowly across the country, Ida dumped months worth of rain on cities in a matter of hours, flooding cities and washing away towns. Nine years after realizing how unprepared it was for a major storm, New York City was once again submerged as the remnants of Hurricane Ida flooded the city. That was just some of the extreme weather tragedies in America in 2021. But obviously, the impacts of climate change aren't limited to the borders of the United States. Intensifying disasters are happening more frequently in more places disproportionately affecting the global south and creating suffering for the most vulnerable people around the world. Despite its death and destruction, we have not seen the end of denial or delay tactics. We have not even come close to experiencing a reckoning with the damage anti-science movements have done around the world. And as we have seen in recent years, that damage extends far beyond the climate crisis. Just like there's been a lot of climate denialism, there's a huge anti-vaccine movement. Dr. Peter Hotez, the world-renowned virologist, knows that like climate misinformation, COVID misinformation had deadly consequences. Here's Dr. Hotez talking in May. The reason 600,000 Americans died of COVID-19 was partly due to the SARS coronavirus type 2. 
it was an equal measure due to defiance, defiance right. of masks and social distancing and, and vaccines. It was death by anti-science. And we have to recognize what a potent force that is. And the burning of fossil fuels has made our climate less stable, our air more polluted, which has only created more disasters and made us more vulnerable to disease. That there is an important linkage between climate change, air pollution in our health. Dr. Maria Neira, the World Health Organization's Director of Public Health and the Environment. And WHO has been working for many years now on demonstrating those linkages and how air pollution is affecting our health and killing every year 7 million people. Again, Dr. Catherine Hejo. It is absolutely heartbreaking to see the extent to which ideological um, polarization is causing all of us to make decisions that run directly counter to our own well-being. And you have to ask the question, if that's the case, who benefits? We live in a world where a relatively small number of people have accumulated extraordinary personal wealth, extracted from natural resources, focused only on short-term gains. In this global economic reality, who really benefits? And how do we move forward to create a better future? You must invest in the uh, quality of our ecological resources. We must be looking at investment as a regenerative uh, action, as something that supports and nurtures and protects the natural resources on which tomorrow's prosperity depends. If you can't do that, you, ca you have no commitment to the future. Economist Tim Jackson. If you're just running down your resources, if you're just overburdening your climate, if you're just destroying other species, then ultimately you're undermining the future. And investment isn't even worth the terminology of being investment. It's a kind of fool's strategy, which can never really benefit anyone but a, a few people in the very short term and, and doesn't support the social good. It doesn't support our ecological integrity. Legendary conservationist, Dr. Jane Goodall. We are part of the natural world. We depend on it for clean air, water, food, clothing. We depend on it for everything. But what we depend on is healthy ecosystems. And an ecosystem is made up of the different plant and animal species that, uh, that is the biodiversity of that particular habitat. And I think of the forest uh, in Africa because I know it best. And in that forest, every little plant and animal has a role to play, every species. And if you see it as like a great tapestry of life, then every time a species disappears from that tapestry, it's like a thread pulled out. And if enough threads are pulled out, then that tapestry will hang in tatters and the ecosystem may well collapse. And as I say, it's healthy ecosystems that we depend on. So if we continue destroying the environment at the rate that we have been, as many different ecosystems as we are impacting, the future looks very grim. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I mean, imagine what this planet must have been like, like, you know, 200 years ago. Astronaut Scott Kelly. Imagine just what this planet, I mean, how beautiful and pristine this place was. And it's really, you know, just this, you know, since the industrial revolution, I guess that we really did some, you know, really messed it up, you know, some significant damage. It's just heartbreaking. And hopefully now my hope is that someday, um, you know, it took us, you know, 100, 200 years to get us where we're at. And it's probably going to take a lot longer to put it back where it was. But I, I, I like to hope and think that someday, um, you know, the earth will be a lot more like it was uh, before we mucked it up. Hope is all about action as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's like we're in a very dark tunnel right now. We, we really are. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star of light. That's hope. But to get there, we've got to climb over, crawl under, work our way around all these obstacles. And if we don't act now, because time's running out, then it may well be too late.